If you were a slave and I were your master, I'd and the you. only way for you to be free was to strike your blow to kill me, what would you do? Oh. I didn't hear him answer. <laughs> I don't like this book. I don't like this book. I know you don't like this book, but you're gonna shut up. We're gonna get through it. This is an important book. <laughs> when you hear someone say they're a Marxist, in the West anyway, they're often rendered harmless academics whose credibility has long crumbled along with the Berlin Wall. When you hear someone say they're a communist, however, it's a declaration that these are no longer ideas, but that they're a person who's willing to put these ideas into practice, like Lenin, Castro, or Mao. In the past couple of years, more and more people are fearlessly asserting the fact that they are in fact communists. In the face of impeding apocalypse brought on by capitalism, either we embrace the possibility of a socialist revolution that could establish communism, or we accept the fact that capitalism is in fact the end of history. To quote Rosa Luxemburg, socialism or barbarism. Engels points out that it is senseless to speak about communism in any other way not on the basis of good or evil, or any sort of morality, but rather to ensure humanity is not annihilated. Communism, then, is more than an ethical necessity. It is a historical and material necessity. The word necessity is what the author Mufawad wants us to focus on here. Mufawad takes issue with what's called movementism, which is when one places one's faith in disorganized rebellions and protests, believing that they will produce a revolutionary critical mass, which at some distant horizon will finally resolve the communist hypothesis. In the late 1900s and early 2000s, he writes, we believed ourselves to be raindrops that would produce a flood capable of sweeping away capitalism, unwilling to recognize that this was perhaps a false analogy and that we were more accurately, in very concrete terms, a disorganized mob, shaking our fists at a disciplined imperial army. How is it that movementism produced a myth which gave the impression that moral spontaneous will that's able to speak truth to power and demonstrations could ever stand up to capitalism and its monopoly over technologies. He puts this down to a rejection of science, claiming that we become cynical through decades of critical theory that has resulted in a scornful mistrust of the word science. This has resulted in a conscious anti-scientism and mysticism that was evident in the US hippie movement of the 1960s. This anti-scientific approach is premised on the assumption that it's a European dogma, not different from a religion that suppresses the world views of those who are Europe's victims. The author is saying that we need to reclaim science in order to move away from this. Science should find its home at the heart of theories of organization and strategy because historical materialism is a revolutionary science. He also hints at the fact that there is a significantly Christian influence on Western Marxism, a self-righteous need to cling to socialism's failures, its supposed totalitarianism, just as the fundamentalist accepts only the evidence that the world is irrevocably fallen. In this sense, the movementist horizon of utopia becomes akin to the rapture. There's an article about this called Western Marxism and the Fetish for Defeat and Christian Culture, which basically says that while religious ideology and its influence on political thought is highlighted in other parts of the world, Christianity's influence on Western Marxism is often overlooked, where essentially only the likes of Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky, Allende are seen to be praiseworthy because they're the martyrs and symbols of suffering since they did not walk the same path of revolutionary necessity that is often so tragic and brutal. 
The desire to cling to movementism speaks more to a desire for a political purity, free from the taint of necessity. But beneath this desire for purity, he argues, lies a fear of necessity, the discomfort in confronting what it would mean to actually address the dilemma of socialism or barbarism, because the only movements that are endorsed are those that have never developed far enough to treat this question as anything more than an abstraction. And it's this abstraction that movementism supports, a faraway horizon that we will somehow, someday, get to. There's a common misconception about revolutionary necessity where it's confused with destiny. As if to argue for the scientific necessity of communism is identical to arguing that communism will necessarily happen. According to Lenin, revolutions are not spontaneous events, and so the very fact of organizing a revolution undermines the concept of some unavoidable destiny. No communist believes in the inevitability of communism. Necessity means that communism is necessary to solve the problems produced by capitalism, not that its emergence is destined. Or as Mafawad himself puts it, water is a necessary requirement for human existence. But this does not mean that every human being will have access to water simply because it is a necessity. Theory wrenched from the framework of revolutionary science can only be radical in its form. At the centers of capitalism, where capitalist hegemony is generally complete, people have been trained since birth to accept the ruling ideas of the ruling class as common sense. One such areas of common sense include a view of history that's not grounded in dialectical and historical material analysis. He cites Foucault as a figure who argues that history should be seen as nothing more than a procession of contingency, and that to speak of the necessity of revolution in this context is also to speak of a totalizing discourse, another game of power and knowledge, where a revolution is no better than what it was revolting against. While the Foucault characterized in the book seems to be at odds with the person debating Chomsky, what Mafawad is hinting at here is that due to the modern desire to avoid totalizing or making necessity out of everything, everything's become contingent. That is, according to him, reflected in today's theories, where theories such as intersectionality are seen to be a mere recognition of the fact that multiple moments of oppression and exploitation, including economic class, intersect. That is not an analysis, it's simply an ineffectual truism which makes these theories incapable of explaining the meaning of this intersection since this would be an act of totalization. He claims that this practice of combining contingency with multiplicity is probably best expressed in Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the rhizome. That is meant to replace a revolutionary ideology based on revolutionary unity. The assumption is that such unity implies totalization and the capture of radical desire. Badieu predicted the saying, Under the anti-organizational pretext, it is not too difficult to see the rejection of the point of view of class. If people do not have their own politics, they will enact the politics of their enemies. The political abhors the void. Mufawad's demand is not to return to the particular communism that was practiced directly after the October Revolution, or even the communism that was practiced in Mao's China. He points out that the most obvious problem of making such a demand is the fact that these revolutions did fail, but that we should recognize that there were important truths established in these revolutions, hard won by the struggles of past revolutionaries. And while communist theory is seen to be a bit <laughs> boring, the solution to this is creativity, but not a creativity that reifies the current state of affairs. In the past, revolutions were almost utopian, but to be utopian now, after so many earth-shaking revolutions, wherein the masses won almost as much as they lost, is to plummet into the revisionist abyss, to wait in hope of spontaneity, while, in the meantime, practicing a peaceful coexistence 
with this brutal reality. A single revolutionary program that emerges from a concrete analysis of a concrete situation on behalf of a dynamic movement is worth more than a thousand academic Marxist books or a thousand eclectic neo-communist theories. If communism is a necessity, then we cannot accept abstract reclamations that cannot grasp the need to make it a reality. We need to demand the concrete. We need to focus on literature produced by movements that are active in class struggle and, due to this activity, have also produced a theory that is itself generated by the necessities of struggle.